Welcome to Four Seas One Family. This is an episode that was supposed to be released in September of this year, but because of audio problems, we had to work to rebuild the audio segment of this episode. So here it is, and thank you for tuning in to Four Seas One Family. Hello, Karen. Welcome to the show. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us here at Four Seas One Family. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure and honor. Well, you know, you know, you and I have, well, I think we met physically at least, I think, one time at, a, at an activity. I, I really don't remember how I really met you. How do we, do you have any yeah. idea? How do we meet each it's other? It's possible, but we definitely met over Facebook. <laughs> oh, goodness. Good goodness. Oh, you, you, would you consider yourself a very active Facebooker or what? Uh, yes, I have to admit to it, yes. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Well, look, you know, you and I are both located out here in Asia, and Taiwan in particular. I, I want to open up with a little, you know, on the light stuff here. What, what brought you out here? What brought you out to this, you know, sunny land in some cases? What brought you out here? <laughs> okay, since I was a kid, I learned languages at home. My father taught me German, took Spanish and French in high school, and they just really weren't quite it for me. I was looking for my language. And then one summer, my, my brother-in-law had said, you know, you shouldn't be messing around with these Western European languages. You should try Russian or Chinese or something like that. So one year they had Russian, so it wasn't my thing. It was still Indo-European. The next year, for the first time, they had Chinese studies, and I had found my language. That was it right there. It was the summer of my um, junior year in high school, and I found what I wanted to that was it. I love Chinese. It sort of became a religion for me because I love the philosophy, the literature, the language, I mean, everything, the whole thing. And so I continued in Chinese. I did go to Germany for a year, but I was just waiting to get back to Chinese, majored in it at the University of Minnesota. And at the time, there was a long waiting list for Americans who wanted to visit the PRC. It was still the Cultural Revolution, so oh. I wasn't able to go. And so the natural place for us to go to learn Chinese was Taiwan. And I had quite a few Taiwanese friends at the University of Minnesota, and they helped set things up for me. And my teacher in the Chinese department helped set up my study plan. So with that all in, all in order, I came over to Taiwan as a student in 1976. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. it was, that's, that's not that's not that long ago. Stop stop acting. You know, it's not that long ago. You know, but but look, well, okay. Yeah. So, how did you prep yourself? I mean, the teachers helped you, but how did you do the me the mental preparation here? Because we're just gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about this later. How, what kind of mental preparation did you do, or do you remember? Of course, I do. Yes, because I had a lot of Taiwanese friends then, and I was with them almost every day, and that's how I learned my Mandarin. Because my students sometimes ask me, how did you learn the Mandarin? Well, I learned it in Minnesota, and it was from hanging out. Of course, I learned in class as well. I learned how to write and read and things. But my oral skills mostly came from my Taiwanese friends, mm -hmm. one in particular who I saw almost every day. Without them, I don't think it would have been as easy as it was. So when I came here, honestly, I didn't feel a lot of culture shock. It felt a little bit like Mexico, but they spoke Spanish. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, but they spoke Mandarin. So what do you feel the difference between learning in the classroom than being out here in the, in the environment where you can actually uh, relate the language to the events around you? That's quite valuable. Can you make a comparison for those who are maybe, you know, in the situation you were at that time, who are thinking about exploring this area or other places? Well, yeah, but in fact, I had already been inside of a Taiwanese bubble, Taiwanese and Chinese and Hong Kong bubble when I was in Minnesota. So it was great to see things in their real context, but I had already been living in something similar in the States already. So it just was not that big of a shock. It's just I learned a lot more in the real context. Mm. What's up then? You just mentioned something about... Well, this not only not only pertaining to Mandarin, but what have you noticed from actually how would you say the 
the, to pull in the connotations of the words you use within this particular culture here. There's some nuances when you study something in a book, you get that dry term meaning, you know, but it doesn't share the cultural nuances from the words that you use in your environment. Do you, have you been in a situation with that? Because I have. Oh, of course. Yes, I absolutely have. And I had to learn a couple of extra expressions that I wasn't used to using in English. The first one I think we have to learn here is Puha <laughs> Yusu. <laughs> so Puha Yusu was one of those I kind of had to adapt to. Just a lot of other things where I think you're switching from a competitive social environment in the state. We really compete with each other socially. Hmm. We can cooperate when it's like a business or a project will cooperate. But in a social situation, people are generally trying to or points, and that way they're better than someone else, and you can keep someone else in their place and keep your high relative higher position. Right. But that does not fly in Taiwan or in Asia in general. You try to raise the other person to make them feel good about themselves and then thus you, and that keeps everybody in a more cooperative social situation. That is something I truly appreciate. I felt that from the very beginning because in the States, I born there and grew up there, but you could feel people are always trying to score points off you, and I did it to other people. In the end, it makes you feel bad hmm. because you're just trying to win, put someone else down, and that makes them feel bad. So the whole exchange is going to be kind of negative in the end. That's always something that was in the background that I find, I find it in all Western cultures, but it's certainly strong in the States. Hmm. Let me let me let me pull back a little bit because, you know, I'm 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 known recently of a person as a person or or interviewer that get canceled from all sides, and I accept that. <laughs> and um, you say what you think, I guess. Well, I try my best to, and um, I have my inherent um, prejudices. You know, we all do, but we you know. Do. We all we all go into a sense of a romantic state when we are in uh, in our uh, how would you say I don't I don't want to call it our dream world or we reach a certain level or or, or in a location that we've dreamt about or things we, we dreamt about doing or environment that we hope we were in one day and you know we for for example my situation when I moved over you know lived over here for a long term is it was there is a type of a romantic situation but then you learn that people have a lot more in common than they think both good Absolutely. and bad and all in and between yep. you know and but then you have to filter out which part do you want to survive in which part do you want to thrive in Right. And it's it's really I totally agree with you. My existence here is still like a dream, still like a dream, dream world. But I edit it heavily. I choose the things that I really love and I kind of ignore the things I don't. I feel exactly the same on that one. So this is this this is this is, you know, I get a questions all the time from people back home. Why do you choose to live abroad with things going on here? But we'll talk more about that, though. But. When you, you know, you know, in education, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But how do you explain things to people back home after living overseas for such a long, long time? Okay. Okay. First, I have to say, I have not been back to the States for more than 10 years. Okay. Very frankly, I don't plan on going back. I'm happy where I am. And when I travel, it's usually usually to a place that I haven't been before. Mm. Like before the pandemic, I spent the summer in France, Grenoble, and I really loved it. So I have no particular purpose to go back, and so I really don't have plans to go back. Now, I know that sounds kind of extreme for some people, but that's where I am. I don't have a trouble. I don't have any trouble reconnecting because you may not be a Facebook fan, but for me, Facebook has helped me track down and connect with people starting from kindergarten. I've wow. had friends from kindergarten on Facebook and then from grade school and junior high, high school, when I was working at the government information office, every single phase of my life, I've got a bunch of friends on Facebook. It's, so it's like I'm connected to them more than I ever was at any one time with all the parts of my life. So I don't mean this as an ad for Facebook. It's got its problems and I don't like about it. But I feel really connected. And those who would have a problem with me being outside the U.S., we generally don't talk that much. The ones that we do probably do talk with, they either don't think about it or it's fine. So, or they just 
what kind of questions you get from those friends back home, the, the kindergarten classmates, you know, when you're coming back or, or, or they, it's just, they're just used to, well, she ain't coming back. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. One time when I went back was really long ago. It was, I gave a little talk at my church to a group of, you know, mostly older ladies. And they said, oh, well, that was really interesting. When you're coming back, you know, and I thought, nope, <laughs> not. Oh. So there were a few people, but usually not people I'm that close to. People that I'm closer to, it's not an issue. Wow. And wow. I think a lot of them, they have also realized that in many ways we have it better here and I try not to go uh, sort of like haha we have it so good here on some things number one we've got our health insurance I mean that that right there is enough and then we also got by for a full year without having to suffer much from the pandemic you know we had a whole year of grace that other people didn't have it's easy for us to get food not very expensively I've got mountains to walk in it's safe here I mean, mm-hmm. the safety issue is huge. I was accosted twice, and that was in the Twin Cities in, in Minnesota. It doesn't seem like it should be a real violent place, but that was also where Toy- Torch Blade took place. So it's not one of the most dangerous cities around or, or metropolitan areas, but I always had to be careful. Right. Here, I go hiking at night with no worries. I, my the list goes on and on about why I love Taiwan. <laughs> And I try not to show off about it because it's just so much better in so many ways. So to you, this honeymoon period is, is still moving, right? It's just keep, it's still it's, moving, it's still progressing. It's, it's lasted over 36 years. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. So, you, well, so you've so you been here, let's see, you've been here four years longer than I have. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. And I was here before then. It's more than that. Well, don't worry. In part two, we'll talk. We'll talk about life here be, uh, uh, before the Jian uh, Yan. Uh, how do you say it in English? My goodness, martial law. <laughs> Been living out here so long. I forgot how to say things in English. <laughs> By the way, I was one of the people who who helped translate the order of the raising of martial law. I also helped translate Zhang Jingbo's final will. And Lee Dong Hui's inauguration speech because I was working for the government information office then, so I mm-hmm. had that little part, you know, being part of history here. You, you mentioned social media; how it has enabled you to connect. Have you seen the effects on how social media has negated some of the interpretations of, say, uh, local events or international events and things like that? Yeah. I have now and then way at the beginning with some of my really old friends, like, like I said, one from kindergarten, first grade, he is a veteran who's injured, often has to go to the vet's administration and is far, far right. Mm -hmm. He's a key supporter. And so of course, interacting with him, he's coming straight from that point of view. I have to give him credit. He was very polite with me, even though I know he's very extreme. He never, really just me or anything so he kept it polite but we realized that we couldn't mm. you know, he's for guns he loved guns you know stuff like that he realizes that you know, there's not going to be any point you know we're trying to argue anything out there's also somebody else who is in my field he's a highly respected professor in the states and he's also very far right mm-hmm. now how i dealt with that is at first i would engage him in debate and then i realized no i realized that the people who have been convinced to either you know to change sides is zero percent nobody nobody ever changes and so i realized that the best way to deal with that is mask this person's post for 30 days so every month i mask them for another 30 days because his stuff i find so provocative that i just don't want to see it i don't want to unfriend him so i just dealt with it by pretty much staying in my bubble most of my friends are liberal like me if they have other things to say, you know, I may just read it and let it pass, but I don't engage anymore. I don't see any point. Mm. So you sound like you got more sun, kind of like, <laughs> kind of like uh, rubbed you dry in some certain ways. You know, you have to like tone it yeah. down, you know. So you need to engage. Everybody knows where they stand. Mm. I, I, I. I, I I was in, in a situation recently where about two years ago, um, 
when um, when one of my friends uh, who is a lot very right, uh, I wouldn't I would call him almost not extreme on a right, but I was in a debate with him, discussion with him on online, and um, what I did was I unfriended him. I unfriended this person yeah. because I felt, you know, but then about two or three days ago, I thought, oh, well, wait a minute. I unfriended him. And now I wonder, was it the right thing for me to do? Yes. Yeah. Being in that temperamental, you know, that type of emotional state, or you just feel worn down. But I had, it, it, it caused me to think, I said, wait a minute, it would have been easy. It would have, I think now that I'm thinking down, remember, I, I, I I unlisted the guy. I unfriended him like three years ago, two two years ago. But I think it would have been better for me to maintain contact with him and allow him to continue expressing his opinions because I unfriended him. He didn't unfriend me. Yeah. Right. So he was willing to to hold this stance, but I can I cannot I cannot say he was disrespectful to me personally. There are some things we don't understand because we're not on the ground there and vice versa. Yeah. You know, it's just the way it is. It's just now we just have to use our experience to kind of like make a bridge that we can both share. And I think by keeping communication open is the best way to do it. You and I are lucky that we come from a nation that has made mistakes, but learned to stand up. Right. And I think about this one practically every day because whenever you read about all this awful stuff happening it's so easy to just slip into this into this really negative space where you think oh everything is wrong what a terrible country and i've felt bad about the u.s many times in my life i was a student in germany for a year after high school and i was also really down on the u.s that year i was always comparing it to europe and when i came back to the u.s my father said you know, Karen, you should go back to Europe. Hmm. I'm just not that happy here. But I got used to it, got sort of reintegrated. But then one thing that I think you need to always keep in mind is yin and yang. Whenever you see this yang, all this sunniness, great. That's the stuff we embrace. There is going to be an in behind it. No matter what sunniness you see, mm -hmm. there's always the other side of it. And you know, we always forget about that. If you think something is good, oh, you may like this stuff on the surface that you see that you judge as good. But behind that good is all this other stuff that is dark. So you have to be able to embrace the yin and the yang, the sunlight and the darkness at the same time. And then you see a lot of these things that was really negative at the time. Over time, maybe they are reminding us of stuff we need to be paying attention to. You know, bad things happen. Oh, bad things happen. Remind us that we have a lot of good things and that we should probably maybe, for example, take care of our own people that are like homelessness, homelessness or something like that. Right. You know, we kind of like to push that under the, you know, sweep it under the rug. So for many things, you have to be able to embrace both the in and the yang. So you're mm. kind of missing out on what life is, I think. That's interesting. Yeah, in the U.S., actually, the thing is that at least let you express yourself both sides. You may think the other side is totally, totally, totally wrong. They should be wiped off the face of the earth. But no. The thing about the U.S. is they allow both sides to continue saying what they think, and mm -hmm. then we have to figure out a way to keep going. That's the amazing thing about the U.S. So whatever it comes down to, I really give the U.S. credit for that. And they have influenced a lot of countries. And look at Taiwan now. Taiwan is also in that place. They're now so free. You can pretty much say what you want. A lot of that is due to U.S. influence. Wow. Wow. That's, this is, uh, once again, you're saying some more stuff here. I, we definitely going to have to have a part two or three because, you know, I'm, I'm in an honest state of mind that I cannot tell throughout history a perfect government or panacea-like panacea uh, existence of any nation because to be a powerful nation, you need powerful deterrence. OK, right. I'm, I don't want to I'm not going to go into the situation of how this can turn into what about isms about, well, the America did this. We should be able to do this now. We should be able to right. take the mistakes yeah. that we learned and not continue those same mistakes, not to say, OK, now it's your turn to do these mistakes, whether it's talking about racism or or this yeah. and that. This is something that's wrong. And this is the dark side. And and, and, you, and you are right, you know. You need to be a, a leader. You do need deterrence, but it doesn't mean you pass on the same 
thing that you did in the past to someone else, and no one has the right to say that or copy you. This is something that I try, and once again, it causes me to get canceled from more than just two sides then. And, <laughs> and it's, into, it's very important and that I we're able to see that. You. you know, it's very important that we're able to see that and, and admit that, okay? But I, maybe some people believe that they always have to choose a side. Yes. One thing, one thing is when you, you find when you relate to somebody one-to-one personally, if you just don't talk about politics, you're not going to find many differences because, oh, come on in, have some tea, you know, how have you been? We like and do all of the same things. As long as we don't get up on our soapboxes, when you relate one-to-one, I've heard so many stories of people, for example, who are against immigration, but when this Mexican person was in need, they helped him. He was just a human. Hmm. So I can see things on a one-to-one basis. Usually we can be okay people. It's just this political posturing that kind of pulls us apart. Tribalism? Absolutely, yes. Hmm. Yes. Well, I, I, and I think that's the reason for a lot of differences. It's just tribalism, nothing else. Because if, for example, your favorite news station, they suddenly started going against this candidate they've been supporting for so long and they got everybody else doing it the people who are in authority who are influential they could probably leave their people somewhere else where they then different from where they are now well you know, as long as their group is is espousing something they will probably fall into place and both sides do this well this is the pop this is what they call the media complex because a lot of it is a business and right. we're infiltrate. Yeah. It's so easy now to get information, but it's so easy to be have your brain ambushed by so many sources of information that people are not able to filter out to find out what is real, what is fake. It they all have a spin to it. To it, they all all media has That's a spin right. to it. Maybe maybe I have a spin to it here, being here at Four Seas One Family. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we all do. Yeah, tribalism can be really. Awkward sometimes, and we see it across all cultures. And like I I mentioned earlier that you and I come from a place where we are able to raise our opinions and have discussions, right? And, And hopefully filter things out, which, well, honestly, causes us to, as a whole, get things done quite slowly. And yeah, you know. Yeah, and there's this thing about filtering. The thing is, if you really know something well, so for example, if I see something in the news about English, teaching, pronunciation, I know right away where the reporter did not know what they were talking about. But if it's something, you know, some obscure, obscure, not even that obscure, historical fact or stuff that's going on in politics that I'm not following very well, our brains are designed to believe everything we hear unless we know something else that goes against it. So Mm -hmm. if I'm already well-versed in something, I'm fine. I'm pretty good as a critical thinker. But for a lot of stuff that I don't know very well, you just take whatever comes in. All brains work that way. And so once you're in a tribe, you kind of rely on the tribe to let that stuff in, and then you don't even have filters up. That's what I see. Unless you know something really well, you just can't filter. You just take what you got. And then if you're in one group, you just get your information from mostly a single source. That confirmation bias can be quite dangerous sometimes, you know, and then exactly. you and they have the confirmation bias and internal gaslighting and posturing and stuff like that that can be hard to filter out. But the more experience you get with dealing with environments and people, it, it helps a lot to help analyze this, this this type of situation. And I see people back home spending so much time with their internal conflicts that they cannot see the picture as a whole, but by them spending so much time, how would you say, engaging in certain rhetoric that doesn't help the nation as a whole, it leaves more opportunity for outside, sometimes nefarious influences to control them through other means, whether it's financial or some other support. They can't, we cannot see that back home. And that really, really bothers me. We see this from certain movements that includes the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, certain radical elements in the United States. I don't care if you talk about QAnon and stuff like that. They it's it's bothers me when I see external influences coming from overseas. We can see it from outside from a different perspective. Do you have you engaged any type of or observed anything like that? 
Oof. I think with the U.S., I feel it most strongly. I follow the U.S. news more closely than Taiwanese news, I have to say. With Taiwanese news, the first thing I'm interested in is pandemic news. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of the back and forth between the two major parties in Taiwan, honestly, I really don't have the patience for it. I want the country to be ruled well. And in my experience, it doesn't matter a whole lot which parties in power. Taiwan has been stable enough to keep its whole government system and civil service system very stable and running well. I mean, you think somebody is providing water, they're collecting the garbage, they're helping you uh, apply for a license when you need it. I mean, all this stuff that needs to be running has been running really well and really, really in a stable way in all of my life in Taiwan. And that is totally amazing. That's the way it's supposed to be. You know, you've got your two sides, usually. There are others, but only two really matter. And they'll always be arguing and dissing each other. But in the end, they're, all of the machinery of the country, all of the civil service system is supposed to be neutral. And Taiwan has mostly succeeded in that. Elections are another thing. I'll keep that out of it. But mm-hmm. as long as the country is running so well, you know, I talked for 30 years and pretty much things ran very well. You know, I haven't had much trouble with, you know, public services, all kinds of things. So that's one side. If the country is running well, let people argue and they can discuss. Mm. I am much more sensitive about things in the state because I think I see them from a different point of view. And having one party or the other in power has made a huge difference in the U.S. Less difference than Taiwan that I could observe. Of course, changes were made. But in the states, one party or the other, they've been huge, huge changes that when a new party comes into power, they have to hurry up and undo because they're very serious. Like, for example, whether you allow how many immigrants you allow in or uh, what kind of benefits people can receive, you know, if you're going to make it harder for people to get food stamps, whatever it is, those things are huge. And when I see those, mm, it really hurts. And so I think I get more emotionally involved in the U.S. things going back and forth than I do in the Taiwanese ones. I want to move on a little bit more on to the perception of uh, how you see the how should world how should nations or people of the world learn from each other? You know, ah, you know, point. yeah. Th- this is something that 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 I'm very concerned about myself. I mean, we have, and I, I mentioned something about what about isms and stuff like that just now. Maybe this can tie into that. But I've been hearing con- con- uh, content coming from people well known that says, "Okay, this part of the world, you don't need to." always look to the West to learn from them. Um, But the West need to look over here. And I do see that a lot in in cases. There are certain elements from from each culture that we need to pull out that we can use for ourselves. But I see that we are picking the wrong things out of each other. (laughs) Well, I I can tell you some of the things I've thought about. I thought about some of the same things even back in the 70s when I was a student here. And the first thing was that If you want to talk about good influence from the West, well, the whole world copies America. I've been following the French news lately because I've been working on my French. And then you can always feel this thing in Europe where they always have to watch out for what the States is doing because they're so far ahead in innovation. They're always coming up with new stuff. Everybody has to pay attention and try to grab onto the things, you know, as they come out, as they come along. And so it's like the U.S. is always a pace setter, no matter what. And so countries are just watching because there's, it's so dynamic. The thing about the states, they're just so dynamic. New stuff is coming out. Pay attention or you're going to miss it. Grab it. Many of those things have been truly good. I'll give a very small example from the 70s. When I came here in the 70s, there were not yet any McDonald's here. Now, some people may think that would be a really great thing without McDonald's. However, restaurants in general were dirty. They were simply not sanitary. They were not well organized. They were not well maintained. The food was usually good, but the place was kind of not, you know, they didn't have like new modern places to sit. And then the sign and everything was just really old and kind of decrepit. And often it was just really, if you use the bathroom, you'd see right away. However, McDonald's came in during that period and hygiene improved across the board. I cannot, you know, you cannot deny it. Mm-hmm. In that, that was something hugely good, that McDonald's, not just McDonald's, but a lot of American fast food, which I hate, which I don't eat myself. Okay. They brought in higher standards 
for sanitation, for hygiene, for making places comfortable. You look at Starbucks. Starbucks has become so powerful. People like to hate them. But look at all the wonderful co- coffee shops we have now with atmosphere where you don't have to just gulp something down or eat up your food and run, which is the usual model for business here in restaurants. They don't want you to stay. They want turnover. But with, Star- with Starbucks coming in, people now want a place that is very artistic and comfortable with a good atmosphere that smells good and lets you stay and work on your, on your laptop. That's something that Starbucks is not the only one, but that's another good thing, in my opinion, that U.S. corporate culture has brought in. Mm-hmm. A lot of it has been very good. It's brought in a lot of awful things. We've now got obesity in Taiwan. When I was a student here in the 70s, mm-hmm. it's like nobody was overweight. Everybody was really thin. You remember those times? Yeah. If you saw somebody fat, you know, you could use that word back then, you would just, like, eyes would open wide. Oh, my God, look at that guy. You would be so shocked because there were so few people. Now, a lot of people are still slim. But you can see a lot of people have been having too much full bad drink, you know. Mm-hmm. And they just gotten in the habit of it's not just Western food. They've got these soft haiku and all this other fried food and mm-hmm. too much, too much oil, too much crumbs, too much sugar, all this stuff. All of that, I think, is no good. It's gone in the wrong direction. Uh-huh. So that's what I'm saying with the yin and the yang. The yang, the sunshiny part is we have better hygiene. And man, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate having a coffee shop where I can bring my laptop and sit down and work out all afternoon. But man, I hate it that a lot of people have gotten in the habit of eating any time of the day instead of three meals a day and eating stuff that's full of sugar and that's deep fried and all this other stuff. So, you know, that's, when you talk about influence, I can see America has brought in a lot of really detrimental trends. Taiwanese should know better, but no, it all came in with a package, mm-hmm. and that's what we've got. Uh, I don't know if that's the kind of thing you had in mind. We have to be careful as foreign nationals living abroad uh, and, and be careful of the standards that we use to judge other societies. This is not only yeah. for us, it's for the others, too. You know, yeah. you and I have become too... Uh, are at, at, at the level where people say we are cultural appropriating things, you know, and maybe that is true for me, you know, because there's some things that I've learned here that in this from this culture, you know, that will stay with me forever. And, and I'm never going to get rid of why, because I think it's good. Of course, right. the, the American part of me is good. And I'm glad I'm able to to filter through both yeah. of them. And, and you know, yeah. You know, and and hopefully do without ignorance, because if I am showing any ignorance, I hope people like you, who clearly have good intentions, are able to say, James, I have another opinion. I want to make a quick comment about cultural appropriation. That term really bothers me, Hmm. because the thing is, from the beginnings of humanity, we have always learned from each other. If some tribe has found a better way to catch game and feed themselves, the other tribe is going to learn it. Wherever there's innovation, of course, we're going to share with everybody. And the reason we are where we are now in this very globalized world is because we learn from each other. You're not going to just sit down, well, I'm going to stick to my own culture uh, for uh, aesthetic reasons and not adopt things. No. As soon as somebody has something that's useful, like social media or like MP3 music or whatever it is, of course, we're going to adopt it. And that is not cultural appropriation. That is learning from each other. I think people get a little touchy about it when it comes to minority groups, mm. and non-white, non-white groups. Like, for example, if white people will wear a tongue you know, wear a, a cheap house, wearing Chinese clothes, that's, that's cultural appropriation. Excuse me, I like the style. I'll wear it. I feel like it. I mean, you're wearing Western clothes, and I'm not excusing you of cultural appropriation. Western clothes have become the norm in many parts of the world. Right. If I happen to like a cheap house, Excuse me, what's, you know, what's it got to do with you? It's not just that. You know, food, you know, we've adopted foods from each other. We've learned better nutrition because we've varied our diet. Things like, let's say, African music, which I love. Go to Africa and learn the some piano, the Ambira. I mm-hmm. love the Ambira. If I had to choose one music style of the whole world, it would be African music. Wow. Now, excuse me, that I go and learn the some piano and learn how to sing in Shona. That's not cultural appropriation. I'm learning something that is beautiful that I love. You're sharing it. 
you know, the way we share all our stuff, we're all sharing. It's not like the minority groups or the non-white groups get to say, oh, you can't appropriate our culture. I'm sorry. Wow. It is just one big pot, and we're all sharing. Excuse me. Wow. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I, I, now that you said you got me thinking about, you know, like, I'm from, I'm from New York City, Fort Apache, South Bronx. And okay. I was there when rap music came out, you know, in the projects, you know. Yeah. I'm living in Asia, and I'm into Mongolian music. There Mongolian you music. My Can daughter you... loves Mongolian music. I, yeah, same I, thing. I'm like, and yeah. it's so good. I was like, wow, I wish I could share with my friends back home, my friends in L.A., Mongolian music. I mean, I was like, what is this? I can understand very little of it. I've taken the time to, you know, but it's like, oh, man, I and I'm and every time I'm at home listening to Mongolian uh, uh, rap, hip hop, whatever. I don't understand a word, but it's something about it. <laughs> Moving right along. Look. OK, going back to the Embira. Oh, okay. beautiful. So Whoa. Here, here is here is the Embira. If you can see it, that's a good shot of it. I keep that out. That's my Embira. And I'm in touch with the guy who built it back in Zimbabwe. And then here is a Deze. This Beautiful. The resonator to make this to um, oh, I see it. Um, yeah, the sound louder. All right. So, and then I got other music. Those are Hoshul. Those are Shakers. Go back. Know. Go back a little bit. I didn't Don't see that. Go back a little bit. I missed that. Go back a little bit. Just a minute. I'm gonna have to get up on a get up. On Be careful. Don't fall through. over there now. <laughs> My insurance okay. doesn't cover that. <laughs> so, so here is a Hoshul. Okay. Next, that goes with Indira music, and then here is my Shona course. Cool. Yeah, and then lots of CDs from Imbira players, like like this one. Okay, beautiful. And then and then yeah, and then Imbira itself here. I mean, I absolutely love this stuff. A student of mine, her uncle made his own kalimba. I got one as a gift that added to the collection. So don't tell me anything about cultural appropriation. We learn from each other. We appreciate and enrich our, each other with our with our cultures. That's cultural exchange. It's not cultural appropriation. So beautiful, you know. Yeah. You know, like I'm wearing this. We call it Songshan Zhuang, Songshan Fu, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I like it. It's comfortable. Yeah. You know, it's good when you have to, you know, move around. Uh-huh. But look, you know, uh-huh. Karen, I'm not gonna. I, you know, there's gonna be definitely. This, you know, after. Opening up and, and, and speaking to you, that's gonna we're gonna have to do a part two and three because it's just too much to talk about, and I don't want to. Your battery's gonna flop out, and I don't want that My to happen. Okay oh, okay. You can pick your, you can pick your time. <laughs> okay, because it, there's so much that this cultural sharing, you know, and learning yeah. from each other is something important too. Because we had people coming from you know impoverished nations going to the West and learn. They went back home. They became innovative in their own way with in their own right. carrying their own characteristics that's great right and we have to be aware that because of that people are, are not going to take what they learned from the west and just sit on it they're going to use it to expand right. their home nation this is something i think as a world we have to be ready to face in the future not harbor right. this is this is what can i'm I saying go back to one, can i go please. back to one thing that you mentioned please yeah. The thing you said about not just the rest of the world learning from the West, but us learning from the rest of the world. Even back in the 70s, I felt this really stronger because in our culture, we can often be really sarcastic about other people. Oh, Mm -hmm. that dress makes you look so young. (laughs) Whatever it is, we can be sarcastic. And it's socially acceptable. It's often the way we interact. Like I said earlier about social competition, it's kind of a way we compete. But that's not how people interact here. They are polite because they think that sarcasm is probably going to make you feel uncomfortable. The very most basic principle for interacting with somebody in Taiwan, and I would say in East Asia in general, is you try to make the other people feel good. That's your job. Mm -hmm. Your job is to try to make the other people feel good. And don't go against them if there's no need. If it's a really serious thing, like they want to do something dangerous, okay. But otherwise, you just try to keep it harmonious, whatever happens. And even if you're not pleased with something, you smooth things over so that the relationship stays alive and stays okay. Mm -hmm. That's something that they just really, really care about. And they'll let some irritating things by because the relationship is more important. 
I think in the West, we're quicker to jump on those things that irritate us, that we think we don't agree with. We'll criticize, we'll use sarcasm, we'll put somebody in their place. We do that so much more. But here, that's not how you interact with each other. And personally, I believe that's something we in the West need to learn from a place like Taiwan. And Mm -hmm. I won't even include the PRC in this one because they've had so much political strife. In Taiwan, people have really kept a kind of a kind of pure heart when it comes to dealing with each other. They want to find the best in you, and they will try hard to find the best in you, and then they will compliment you on whatever it is. You know, oh, you can say xie xie, oh, ni hao di hai, whatever it is. They just want to focus on something good and then kind of go from there rather than constantly be knowing and noticing all of your flaws, which we all have, and then maybe expanding on those. So if you're always focusing on the good, trying to connect, realize the relationship is more important than a lot of this other stuff, you end up closing fewer doors. So when you need something someday, oh, this person actually could help me, and you didn't destroy the relationship when you were sarcastic one day. This is something I felt really strongly ever since I was a student here in the 70s. I think I had a lot of those good habits. And when I said something sarcastic to somebody, my host sister said, Hmm. And that sentence changed me on the spot. I thought, you know, I didn't think before I said it. It came out because it was just my habit from the U.S. I, so from then on, I realized I didn't change on the spot. I tried to. Mm-hmm. You need to use this Taiwanese way of interacting with people. You try to make the other person feel good. That's your job. And you have both end up much happier and much more cooperative. Here, connections are very important it's out here in Asia. Right. 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 And, and it has changed a bit. You can see it. But in some ways, they maybe needed to become a little bit more open and straightforward rather than always agreeing too politely. Being more willing to tell the truth, you know, when it when it doesn't feel good. Chinese have always been better at that than, say, Japanese. You know, when it comes down to it, they say, oh, you know, Pongo, you know, <laughs> Now, they will tell you the truth about a lot of things when it comes down to yeah. <laughs> this, 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 yeah, it depends yeah. on the on the level who you're talking to. That's true. I have Taiwanese friends that I've known for years, and when we talk to each other, if you're an outsider, you'll swear to God that excuse me, you'll swear that we're arguing with each other, but we're not. We're just friends. Yeah. And yeah, that's and, fine. You can engage. It's it's, but it's crazy. On the basis of you still love each other, you still respect each other, and then it's fine. Yeah. That is, it's really weird. It's, it got me thinking because this, this opens up discussions at, at another level. I want to talk a little bit about how do you feel about how people here, people you know overseas, how do they look at our home nation, especially after what happened after January the 6th? January 6th. I mean, yeah. this this yeah. bothers me because I have friends come up to me and say, "James, what, what's going on?" Friends who are educated in in, in North America, you know, I, and and I'm I'm just tripping over my tongue. And when I'm straight with them, it hurts them, and I really it hurts yeah. them. I mean, me. what what kind of repercussions or waves have you received from your friends out here, friends and family? Well, I think just this whole past presidency before the current one, my Chinese friends and family were saying, Mei wo mm-hmm. <laughs> it was just constant. They just couldn't understand how this could happen in America because they had this idealized vision of America as a place that worked out those things, that they were able to solve these terrible political problems that other countries struggle so badly with. Every country does because the world is about power. Humans are about power. The globe, everything is about power. And in the end, how are you going to make sure that one side doesn't wipe out the other side? You know, getting that to work so that people can both, you know, coexist in relative harmony so they don't destroy each other. I mean, that is the problem of every group of humans on Earth, every country. And people looked up to America as having done much better than many countries. Man, you've got freedom, you've got democracy, you've got free elections, you've got blah, blah, blah. Well, the problem is that we are all human, and we are not omnipotent. Our system is not perfect. And because it is so open, it means a lot of this stuff is going to break right wide open just because the system is so open. And when you see this stuff happen and these conflicts, then you have to get down to raw power and how does 
power exercise itself. What happens when one side is at a somewhat somewhat at a disadvantage? They may come to believe in power at all costs. Mm. If you have one side that believes in power at all costs, then all bets are off. Then they're going to cheat. They're going to do anything to get power. Both sides do it. But if one side has a relative advantage, they probably don't have to stoop that low. Right. If they're at a disadvantage, they're going to stoop lower because they're desperate and they want to get the advantage back. This is how I interpret the past four years before before the recent election in the U.S. They stoop low. They resorted to anything outright lies, cheating, corruption that everyone could see. None of it seems to matter within the tribe because they believe the end justified the means. When you have people who believe that the ends justify the means, then you've just got all-out raw power struggle, and that's what I've seen. And we're going to try to raise it back up to, okay, we have differences, and we're still going to you know, engage with each other, but, man, we've got some rules. How about if we follow some rules? And people who break the rules seriously, you're hurting people, there are consequences. We have to accept that. And if we stop accepting that, then our nation is in big trouble. And that's how I view January 6th. Wow. Yeah. Um, Karen, there's two things I want to ask you before we press the pause button here. What has your life abroad taught you about yourself? And what would you say to those who are currently in the situation or state of mind you were in before you made your journey out here? Well, a lot of it is very personal. It may not apply to a lot of other people because I am a language nut. I love languages. And when I found Chinese, I found my language, my language that I wanted to study my whole life. And just living in Taiwan every day, I can use Chinese every day. Just that alone is a big joy. Every morning, one of the first things I do is I read a passage from Xiao Zai Ji Yi, which mm. is a collection of ghost stories from the Qing Dynasty. It's really difficult because he wrote in a really a really archaic Wenyanwen style. But this is what I've been doing every day for years now is I read some Wenyanwen every morning. It just makes me so happy because I always learn a new expression that, oh my God, I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, a certain kind of hair that they used in China or a certain kind of food that they ate. I mean, I learned something new. I'll learn a new character expression. Just that alone gives me joy. Beyond that, just being here, Loving where I am, I live on a mountain, gives me joy. Having people around me who are so who are so tolerant and so encouraging and forgiving and don't seem to just look at you and then look away. I don't know if you've noticed this, but at least among a lot of Americans here, when you see another American on the street, they purposely ignore you. <laughs> they pretend like they didn't see you. <laughs> now, I've noticed this for years. And see, this doesn't happen in the U.S. I'm from Minnesota. It's the land of Minnesota night. If you smile at someone, they smile back. They say hi. We don't know. It doesn't matter. That happened to me almost everywhere I've lived in the States. And I've lived on both, you know, in many places in the States. But here, there's this unspoken thing that <laughs> if you see another Westerner, you pretend like you don't see them. There was one time there was this white lady who was, you know, a little younger than me. She gave me this furtive glance and smiled a little bit. She says, like, I'm, it's like she was saying, I'm breaking the rules. Haha, I'm acknowledging you. Hi. Hmm. You know, I don't know if you noticed this. Actually, with black Americans, I've noticed a lot of them will you know, like, give them a high five or something <laughs> to each other because they're a smaller group and they, they're more cohesive. A lot smaller, yeah. But this is, what, this is what black people have told me. Oh. But I think that this habit is really strange. I don't know why people do this. I've just you know, given up on trying to say, you know, smile at an American. If I see a Taiwanese, I may smile and they'll smile back. That is something that's really weird. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but in general, and in general, it's just the way treat people treat each other here. That is what I love here. Uh, that's how it's changed me. I think coming here as a student, like I said, you know, the example I gave when I was said something rude, it's taught me better manners and be more considerate of other people. I think that's at the heart of it is the same way. If we can, like, spread that around the world, especially to the States in these times, Man, I think that'd be a great thing. And those who are in the, currently in, in the situation you were in before you came out here, what would you say to them or what kind of encouraging words you would give them to kind of explore? Not necessarily here, but here in, in Asia, but yeah. elsewhere. And, and what benefits yeah. or what to expect? 
okay, rather than being a one-to-one thing, because I kind of select my own friends, a lot of them are like me. But as for suggestions in general, number one, I think we need to improve foreign language education in the state. Mm. Learn a foreign language. And the thing is, people don't think they have to learn a foreign language well if they say, oh, yo, soy Americano, and that's about as far as they get. Without really trying to get into it, they don't want to sound like they're too Mexican or whatever. They don't want to have too much of an accent. People will think you're weird. Because when you go to another country, you just use English anyway. Mm -hmm. But if you get yourself into a space where you really need to use that language, and there are a lot of language teachers online who are encouraging that, you suddenly realize that you're on the other side of the fence. The other person has the advantage, and you have to try harder to be culturally appropriate. You know, right now, it's like we set the rules for what is culturally appropriate, our Western way. Because we're speaking English, we sort of fall into that role. But if we are struggling with the language, someone else is deciding what's culturally appropriate. If you've been put in that position, you're going to be a little more humble, a little mm-hmm. more considerate. Yeah. The language. So I would encourage people to learn a language. Yeah. Yeah. When you learn the language and also the nuance of how the terms are used, you get a certain insight that you're not able to get from history books or some right. kind of uh, um, uh uh, you know, uh, uh, what is that called? Uh, social sociology. <laughs> My English, <I'm, laughs> you know. Yeah, Karen, thank you for joining us here on Four Seas One Family, and you take care and Baljo. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you to all our viewers.